Hello and welcome to another episode of Ken Training, where we want to give you, the YouTube audience, the training that you need to tackle projects like this one on your own. Today's project is going to be installing this device right here, which is an EasyTrap ETZ226. So this is I'll have links for everything in the description below so you don't have to worry about recording all of your model numbers and so forth but this is the device that we're going to be actually installing what does this device actually do the reason why you want to install this is because you have a furnace with an air conditioning coil and what happens is is that an air conditioning coil is naturally going to extract moisture and water out of the air, drain it down a drainage system, and have it exit the, the furnace. It's either going to go to a condensate pump or it's going to drain by gravity outside of the residence to somewhere outside, which is what's happening in this residence that I'm in right now. There's no condensate pump. It just drains by gravity outside and it just does that. What happens is, is these drain lines, if they're not serviced with a preventive maintenance cleaning and flushing out, they can become clogged over time. When they clog, if you don't have one of these devices, depending upon how your furnace was installed, they'll clog and then the water will begin to back up and overflow in, at the furnace. And then if you have a pan, like a secondary drain pan, which this one does not, you could go into the drain pan and maybe you have a switch in the drain pan that shuts off or something like that. Every installation is slightly different. This is this particular house is in SoCal and we have a closet in the hallway and this furnace and coil is installed in this hallway closet. So if you were hypothetically installing your air conditioning and coil in the attic then you would have a drain pan underneath in which you could have a secondary uh, float switch in the drain pan. Uh, that would be a secondary drain pan, meaning that the primary one, uh, the primary drain uh, clogged up, draining into the secondary drain pan, and then then you would shut the switch off there. But I don't want to. I want to focus on my installation. I'm trying to explain to you that we that we are doing today. So this is your device. It's the it's the Easy Trap. This cost, like to say, under 20 bucks on Amazon. The top, you just gently turn it slightly, and you can take it apart. This is what it looks like. This is your float mechanism. And the beautiful part about this one here that I purchased is that when 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 this is installed, this is what it looks like. So there's a little stem here to tell the user, hey. The float has risen, meaning that this is all uh, this. There's water in here that caused the float to rise. That should never happen under normal operating conditions. This float is only going to rise and pick up the stem if this back, if the primary backs up and the water level is lifting up here in the secondary. It lifts this up. This switch here is normally closed. What that means is is that when this float is in the down position, the normal position, this switch, which is these two black wires right here, is closed, allowing the circuit to, to pass through the switch. If this was, was to back up and this rises, this switch would open, preventing and shutting something off. I can choose where to land these wires. I am going to land these wires on the yellow wire. We're going to intercept the yellow wire on the thermostat control board of the furnace because what we want to do is we are going to shut off the outside condenser. We're going to allow the indoor blower motor to run. So the customer is calling for cooling, which puts the indoor blower motor on and the condenser on outside. If there's a water backup, we're going to open this switch and it's going to shut off the cooling but still give the customer the indoor blower motor to at least have some air circulation. The house is going to be hot, that's why they're asking for the cooling. So it gives the customer a measure of some relief but not 
enough relief. They're still going to get too hot because they don't have that condenser. We have to clear the blockage, get the water level to go down, then the customer, then the switch will drop down, closing the switch, giving the customer the condenser, giving them full cooling. So, we want to install this switch. The first thing that we want to do is uh, we'll op we're going to I'll show you the furnace right now and we'll show you exactly where I want to intercept it. All right, everybody, this here is the furnace. You can see that this is a pane furnace, and then right at the top of this furnace is the air conditioning coil. You can see two lines right here. This is the liquid line that I'm touching and this is the suction line. The refrigerant comes in here, goes through some type of a metering device, allows the uh, refrigerant coil to get nice and cold, extracting that heat out of the warm air, and then the, ref the refrigerant vapor is going to go back to the condenser. This here is your primary drain line that you can see. Now with this installation, the installer did not put a P-trap in here. In this case, it's okay because this is under positive pressure and the P-trap is optional on this installation. It's actually, I even believe it to be more beneficial to not have the P-trap because that there's a because this is a positive pressure your water is coming into this line and there's a little bit of air pressure coming in here pushing that down the drain line and exiting the residence keeping this line clear so as but this here is your secondary drain port that's been capped off since installation we are going to intercept remove this cap and we're going to put our easy trap right there that's the secondary drain port of the the uh, condenser coil. Now, the tool that you're going to use to, to remove that cap is just going to be a half inch drive socket set which mates absolutely perfectly inside of the um, of that of that plug for the uh, um, for the secondary drain port. So all we have to do is just uh, loosen that up and remove that. That's a three quarter inch threaded connection. So on our easy trap, which is right here, that is a three quarter inch threaded connection right there that we are going to intercept and put right there. Now, for the wiring, you can see the thermostat wires and the condenser coil wires are coming down here. It's a little bit dark. Get you a little bit of lighting here. And right here on the side of the furnace, is where those two wires go in. So we are going to uh, get this set up and then we'll bring our wiring down here and we'll figure out where that um, thermostat main uh, PC board is. Alright, so I took off the furnace panel cover which was just one uh, screw that, that uh, you just use with the thumb screw. Uh, now I want to get over to where the control board is, so I got to get behind this panel. There's two quarter-inch uh, uh, hex heads, one there and one here. So I want to uh, use my my cordless drill and go ahead and extract that. As long as I'm in here just looking, uh, you have the uh, the inducer fan motor right there. You can see the exhaust gas is being vented out right here. Uh, pressure switch right here. Uh, so you have the main, this uh, so main incoming power is right here. Uh, natural gas is entering right here. And there's your burner uh, manifold right here. So just a little bit of a quick explanation about some of the uh, parts. Some type of a, a high temperature uh, safety cutout switch right here. In case there was a problem. Okay, so let me go ahead and pull this off and let's look inside there. We should see the blower motor and we should see that furnace control board. All right, so here's the uh, panel door. I pulled off the uh, two screws that I told you about. So I got the panel door off. On the back of the panel door is a really nice uh, schematic of the unit. We don't really need to focus in on the uh, schematic, but just to show you, there is a schematic there if we ever did want to see that, but we don't need it. Now we have access to the 
main board for the furnace. These, this uh, terminal board right here is the thermostat uh, terminal board. When you're uh, over here on the side, I know it's, I'm trying to get you like just perfect. Those are the um, the thermostat wires. So starting at the bottom, this one here is for the red, then the next one up is the yellow, white, and then there's a common, and then there's the blue one for the blower motor, okay? The wire, now when you're looking at your wiring, there's going to be two sets of wires. I'm, I'm holding the two sets of wires here in my hand. One of them, this, this one here with my thumb, that is from the thermostat. The one down here that I'm holding now with my thumb, this is the one going to the condenser. How do I know that, Ken? Because if you look and I follow this, this cable back, I can see that there are two wires right here, and these two wires are intercepted into the Y cooling and the C common. The two wire one has to be the one going to the condenser. The other one, which is this one here, if you look at all those wires, those are all the thermostat wires. Y for cooling, red for the hot 24 volts, blue for the fan, and white for heating. Okay, so we are the the where we want to capture our wire is is we're going to capture it going to the condenser. That's what I want to intercept. So this in this case, it's the red wire right there. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt that red wire right there, and that's where I'm gonna wire into. Okay, so I want to demonstrate what I mean by normally open and normally closed. So the switch, so I have my meter off right now, but as soon as I turn this on with the switch down, if the switch is working properly, which I'm sure it is, the switch, it, this is, the meter is going to beep because this in the down position, when the float is down, it is closing the switch. Now watch. See that light? You can hear the beeping. Switch is closed. When I push up with my finger, indicating or simulating a water blockage in the primary drain line, lifting the float here on the secondary drain line, you can see that it is going to open the circuit and this is how we are going to interrupt that cooling cycle or the cooling, cooling uh, circuit, the 24 volt signal that goes to the condenser outside. This is how we are going to interrupt it. This is what this switch does, the easy switch. So I just wanted to explain to you in case you're not 100% sure like exactly what this device is doing. So I just wanted to explain that. Okay, first thing we want to do is I want to remove this plug so this way we can uh, put our PVC fitting in here so that we can connect on our, our device. So we're going to use this half inch socket set, stick that in there, and just turn that. Okay, so with the plug removed, you can see that what they've got here is they've got the factory coil must have had like a total plug in there, uh, plug, uh, or something. You can see like a portion of it, half of that has been removed so that the water level would have to rise up above that like floodgate and then come into here to come into where we're going to put our switch. That's okay because under normal conditions this section should be completely dry anyways. So we're going to go ahead and um, tape and dope this uh, threaded connection and, and we'll leave that just with that factory the way that they left that originally and we'll just tap in right here and, and go in like that. Alright so now I want to dress this three quarter inch threaded connection. This is white Teflon tape so what I'm going to do is take the white Teflon tape and get it onto my threaded connection here and I'm going to wrap that at least three times. So there's one, two, three, I'm actually going to go four and that should be fine. Now, in all honesty, that is probably going to be perfectly fine, but as an, uh, as an added backer and just for a little bit more uh, protection, I do have some liquid thread sealant. So go ahead and do a zoom in right here on this where my, where my uh, finger is, just to show the audience this uh, material. Okay, so go ahead and pan back. So we're going to use this uh, pipe thread sealant, which is a recto seal, and it's got a white in color to it here. 
and I'm just going to put a little bit on my brush. And by the way, I like to do this with plumbing fittings as well. This combination using first Teflon tape and then some liquid pipe dope, this combination is the best combination that you can use to prevent uh, leaks. So you want no callbacks, this is the procedure that I use out in the field. So I'm just going to put a little bit of this uh, pipe dope right on top of my uh, Teflon tape, just like that. Doesn't doesn't need a huge amount, but I'm going to go ahead and put some. And it, this is not highly, highly critical here because this is just an overflow, but just to have a little bit more protection, there is my um, PVC fitting completely dressed so I can put it into the to the machine now. Okay, so now everything is, the fitting is dressed. Here's our, our, um, our coil. I'm just going to go ahead and screw in. When you screw in, it's your standard righty tidy lefty loosey. So we're going to turn it to the right, which is clockwise, and we are going to screw that in. Now you don't have to go absolutely crazy tight, but I have my uh, channel locks here, and I would like to get that uh, a little bit tighter than, I don't want that just hand tight in other words. So I'm just going to go ahead and bring that in tight. Okay, that's good. I'm completely bottomed out. This uh, joint should be completely tight. I'm just going to take a paper towel here with my finger and just kind of go around it just to make sure that there's not an excessive amount of uh, pipe dope or Teflon tape and just make sure it's a it's a clean uh, clean fit uh, clean seal right there and we are completely fine okay so next we want to put this part on right here all right now here's our our um, the fitting in which our float switch goes inside of that's going to go right here this is a PVC joint normally like this person the installer did previous to me they used PVC glue to glue this up in this case I actually don't want to use PVC glue if I use PVC glue you're not going to be able to unscrew this because it's going to hit this PVC pipe which is hard piped in so what I'm going to do in an effort to put this in, which, which by the way, this is already a pretty tight fit, okay? I might be fine just on its own, but just to give myself a little bit of insurance, I have here thread locker. This is the blue thread locker. I'm going to put a little bit of blue thread locker on this PVC nipple sticking out, and then I'm going to mate this PVC uh, portion into there. I'm just going to seat that and let that sit and set up. Uh, and if you ever need to break it, I should still be able to um, take and break these two fittings apart without destroying anything and then reusing this. So I'm going to try to install this in such a way that it's leak proof and reusable in case you ever need to gain access to it again. By the way, I want to mention one thing. This is your float mechanism here. Do you see how the float has kind of like, it's not perfectly round, it's got volutes to it. And when you look inside of here, go ahead and zoom into that. Can you, the audience, see that there's a, a, a section where my finger is touching that is actually protruding inside of this fitting? Go ahead and pan back. Now, the installers of this device, the way that they did it, I have the choice. By the way, this does not spin. This this uh, voluted section float mechanism, it does not spin. It's fixed. So as long as this section, which by the way, they should have given me this completely smooth on the inside. I did not build this. I am installing something that somebody else built. So, but if I have a choice as the installer of where this goes in, because I can install it like this, or I can install it like this. You see how I have choice here? So I might as well install it so that the, the greatest depression of this volute is going to match that protruding rib that is sticking inside of here. So when I go to make these two, two together, which is, is not a permanent thing, it's just sitting in there and, and, and you have the choice of how you want to do it, I'm going to install it so that it, that it, it is absolutely free of movement and that there's no hindrance from a rib or anything like that. Shame on easy trap for actually 
having this thing um, built in such a way that there was an internal rib. So I wish that was an internal smooth. But anyways, I just wanted to show you that as the audience. Okay, so we want to go ahead and put this in. Let me get my thread seal on there. Okay, I got my blue and I'm just going to put a little blue on there for the thread locker. And I'm going to have to use my finger to put that all the way around. And we're totally good. And now all I have to do, and I'll just put a little bit on this fitting as well, so the male and the female section. And now I'm just going to take this, make sure it's level, and just push it on. Hang on one second. There we go. Push that on all the way. Now, that should, that should be good. And it feels pretty solid. So we should not have an issue uh, with this whole thing. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and seat the uh, float mechanism inside of here. That black sharpie line right there is matching where the rib is located inside. So as I put this in, I can see my recessed section of the uh, float mechanism is like this. And so this is going to go pretty much like that. So that way there's this float. And by the way, and that one nice thing about this float that I purchased, you can actually operate it. And I can feel that it is not being hindered by that rib on the inside. The installation, uh, the way that I did it is perfect. So I just wanted to demonstrate that for you. So now we have to hook up our wiring. So we are, we're at the furnace. Before I start fooling around with this thing electrically, here is where the furnace is plugged in. I'm just going to go ahead and unplug it. And that way I don't have to worry about anything being live inside of the furnace. Okay, so I got my lines, the two lines here that are from the easy trap that I want to intercept. So I want to come down and I want to go in the same opening that the that the, uh, the furnace opening that they used for the thermostat wires. The problem is is that the original installer did not install one of these devices here. This is the device that is the um, an electrical device so that when you cinch it down it prevents the wire from chafing. Let me show you what the wires look like now and then I'll show you what the wires look like after. Okay so this is what it looks like inside of the furnace and you can see how the wires are just going through that opening. I'm going to go ahead and install uh, this device right here so this way that everything will be smooth and we don't have to worry about chafing. Okay, so now in order for me to do and put this uh, electrical device in, I need to take the wires out of the unit. In order to do that, I need to disconnect these wires. Because you might, even me, as, as a, uh, an HVAC technician that plays one on, uh, on TV, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my cell phone, I'm going to take a picture of that wiring before I touch it. That way, when I go to put the wires back, I can, in case I forgot something, I can review my picture to determine uh, exactly what happened. So I'm just going to go to my camera roll and snap a picture here real fast. And I am totally good. Put that camera away. Come on. And now, I already got the electricity off. I don't have to worry about electricity. And I'm just going to go ahead and unscrew all my wires. Okay, I've got everything wired in. Let me show you what I've done. The first thing that I did was I installed this device right here, that electrical device I told you about to prevent that chafing. So looking at it over here on this side, it is uh, all tightened up nice and tight so this way the wires can't bounce around when the blower motor is operating. Secondly what I've done is I've already taken all of my wiring and hooked it up and then I put in some zip ties here to make sure that everything is nice and uh, tight so I don't have to worry about anything uh, coming loose or anything of this nature. Now, 
the wiring, the original wiring is back the way that you saw it with one exception. The one exception is the black wires that are, I'm touching them right there. Those are the two wires going to the easy trap. So what I've done is I've intercepted a yellow wire, the yellow lead here that goes to the condenser and I've broken it and it goes to this red wire right there which is how I am interrupting the circuit that goes to the condenser. So the condenser has got two wires which is the white and black wire. You can see those two wires right there, the white and black wire. Hang on a second. I'll try to get this as cleanly as possible so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. I'm sorry. So it's this white wire here and this red wire. Those are the two wires that are going to the condenser. So I've interrupted this red wire and I put the easy trap in between. This is the, the easy trap does not have polarity. It doesn't matter how the wires go this way or reversed. It's irrelevant because it does not matter on the polarity. And just that one blue wire nut, I'm lined up right there. So this way when you operate the if the easy trap were to operate and the easy trap were to lift up like this, it's going to it's going to interrupt that those that uh, 24 volts going to the condenser. Okay, the last thing to do is put everything back together and go ahead and test it. So, all right, so we have our thermostat here. We're going to take and lower the. We're going to first of all we're going to put the thing in cooling. So for the cooling mode is is right here. So let's go ahead and go to cool. We know that we're at 76 degrees Fahrenheit now. Set point is at 78 degrees Fahrenheit. We have to lower it below set point for the, ther for the thing to go into cooling mode. So let's bring that down to 70. And now that we're at 70, we should hear everything start up. You can hear the blower motor start and the condenser should be on outside. So Let's go ahead and see if we have the condenser on outside. Okay, there's our condenser. You can clearly hear the condenser running. Now let's go trip the switch. All right, here's the switch right here, and we want to figure out how we want to trip it. Now I could just lift that up, but I'd have to hold it, and I want to go outside and hear that condenser. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift this out of its, um, out of its home, and I'm going to take the switch and I'm going to push it down like that, simulating that it is um, uh, a water flow. So I've got to make sure that, that um, I'm doing that properly so I can get it to stay. I might have to put some weight on it. It's a little hard. Okay. Okay, right about there. And it is kind of staying there. Let's go see if that condenser shut off. Okay, you can see that the uh, condenser is clearly shut off so we have it wired correctly so let's go back inside and button everything back up okay we're back at the furnace and if you can hear that I can tell that the indoor blower motor is working so that's telling me that the when the when the float switch does go to an overflow condition that it is going to keep the blower motor on and shut off the condenser exactly how I wanted it to go. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to come over to the thermostat, put it back to the setting that we first started at. When we first started, the, this thermostat was set at 78 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm just going to set that at 78 degrees Fahrenheit and set the setting to cool. And that's going to shut off the uh, the system. Okay, so now again looking at my volutes of my float switch, I'm going to make sure that when I put that in, I I can't put a black sharpie mark here, but I could possibly put a piece of tape or something just to try to line those up. But anyways, I know that it goes in like that. I'm going to operate the uh, float just to make sure that it's not binding as I do this. And you can see how freely that's going. I know it's not binding. This is all good and this is properly seated in. So this is back to normal operation the way that it should be. Okay, so that is going to conclude this video on installing the EasyTrap ETZ226. 
Um, I hope that you have enjoyed the video. Please, if you got any value out of this video whatsoever, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel, Ken Training, to check out my other series of videos, and I will catch you on the flip side. Thank <laughs> you.